Okay, I don't like writing them like that. I think that's too abusive of notation. I said Q is just a column vector. P is just a column vector. So we'll just transpose to get the right thing. Ones. So we'll list the column vector, list the column vector, and we'll transpose the whole thing. Boy, does that look messy. Okay, so if someone hands you a Q and a P, I hand you a Q and a P, you think of them as in part of one long vector. And the symplectic form here, which is that it's bilinear, non degenerate, uh, anti symmetric, is just this baby. Take the Q's and P's from the different pairs and take their end products and subtract them. This whole thing is natural to do this multiplication first. That's what I did, you, did to show the algebra. But if you do this multiplication first, then you get a nice row vector. So if someone hands you a q1 and a p1, you put them together as a big vector, and you say, ah, you take its transpose, I get a row vector, and multiply that on the right by a square matrix, I'm going to get a row vector. Row vectors are just linear functions that take spaces of column vectors. Now, the whole space of Q's and P's that someone might feed you, they're going to just stick it on the right. So this whole thing on the left is now just a linear operator. That means this one hands you a Q and P. You can take the transpose, multiply by J on the right, and you get a nice operator on your regular, original big vector space into the scalars. We have another notation, which is that for two fields here, we're going to define the Poisson bracket to be this sum of the differences of products of partial derivatives. But you might say, this is a sum over j's. So what if this were a vector? And this was a vector. But this does look like a vector. It looks like the first three components of the gradient of f. And this looks like the second three. So our q1 is right here. Uh, the second part of that first vector, so here's half our first vector, it's got a P and Q part, it's gradient does. So if you think of F as a function of Q and P, then the gradient of F has a Q component right here, boom, and a P component right here, right there. And the P component of the gradient of G is the second part, the parts, the uh, here, and the first three components of the gradient of G are the first three components, they'd end up right here. So this kind of product looks just like this, and in fact, that is the case. This was by definition, but we can take the gradient of F, gradient of G, and Thinking of them as six dimensional vectors, if we could transpose that and stuff J in the middle, then we get a nice scale that is the Poisson bracket. The textbook has some other notation in between the two. I wave my hands a lot because I don't understand that notation. I think this, thinking of this as just the first three components of the gradient, this is the, the second half of the gradient. So the first half of the big vector, the second half of the big vector, boom. Similarly, the second half of the big vector, the first half of the big vector, which big vector? The big vector that does the gradient of G. And then I think it's really clear that it's just a regular old symplectic form. One of the reasons we talked about energy being conserved is that if you have a Hamiltonian, you have a whole space of places where the solutions might be. So, if you had a one-dimensional system, you might say, here's my x-coordinate. Physics is a second-order differential equation, so the x-component of my velocity is also important. But once I've got this, if a force didn't depend explicitly on time or something, then 
Now I have the property of mathematicians like to call something a phase space. You have enough points to determine what happens. So once you know the position, zero, the velocity, say one. Now you know enough to figure out what happens because you can figure out the force. So you have the change in velocity, you know the velocity, so you know the change in position, you're going to be able to figure out where it goes. For instance, here the velocity is positive and x is zero, so x is going to increase. We don't know which direction it's going to go because we don't know if the velocity is going to increase, a positive force, or decrease, a negative force. We definitely know it's going to go to the right just because the velocity is up here. If you have this point, the velocity is negative, so you could go like this, depending on the force was negative, so the velocity is going to get even more negative, but then the force is positive, so the velocity is going to get smaller. But mathematicians like this just because you have enough coordinates to uniquely determine a solution. When a physicist says space, space, you might imagine that this has to be the x component of the momentum. And you might say this has to be a Hamiltonian system. And now he knows that you have some region of phase space. Each point in that region is going to flow. You can make a vector field describing that flow. In fact, we know what the change in q and the change in p are, because that's what we computed. That's what the Hamiltonian does for us. But as an exercise, the volume is preserved. So we've chosen the right units for a volume in phase space so that it really has a meaning. If you measure the volume in phase space at one time, it's going to correspond to a volume in phase space that's the same. So to a physicist, this is very meaningful as a phase space to make sure it's momentum. Got a whole Hamilton system set up.